My next guest is the former national scout for the Dallas Cowboys. I want to welcome on Drew Fabianic. Drew, how's everything going? Not bad. How are you today, Zach? I'm good. I'm good. I'm. I, it's it's pretty hot out in D.C. It's like 92. I'm kind of hoping it goes down a little bit today, but at least it's not a pouring rain in like it was over the weekend. Yeah, at least you got out of that. But now yeah. down here, it's already it's already a blast furnace down here already. Where, where are you based out of? Uh, out of McKinney, Texas, right okay. now, right next to Frisco, where the you know where the star is and where the, oh, the cool. office is. Really is it, close. I mean, you know, it was uh, 15 minutes. You know, no, no lights. I mean, it was really, it was really easy to do. We did it on purpose because we knew it was coming out here, so we we built purposely so it'd be closer to the office. Oh, cool. Is is the, is the star there? Is it as is it as insane? Is it as insane as people say it is? Like, uh, yes, very <laughs> much so. That's awesome. Um, it, all the bells and whistles. You can you can't even imagine what's there. I mean, there's any kind of restaurant you need. Um, you know, they've got. I mean, heck, uh, Dr. Pepper Corrig is now based right behind us now, too. I mean, it's 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 a it's an incredible facility. And then how how far is it from like the city, this Dallas, like the city? Um, down the tollway, about maybe 30, 35 minutes. OK, you know, uh, from the stadium, about 40 minutes. OK, you know? but it's, it's a great area. It's a it's a great suburban area, but it's also got everything you need. Yeah. Um, you know, like I said, it's it was well planned out. The, yeah. the Joneses did one incredible yeah. job with it. Because I know, I don't know if you've been following around any of the stuff that's going on with the Washington, the Commanders, all this stuff with their new stadium. And obviously there's some stuff kind of going around in the background with the Commanders, but they're uh, uh, potentially planning on moving um, their practice, which is now in Ashburn, which is a good 40 minutes from um, FedEx uh, down towards Woodbridge. I'm always kind of curious about kind of the distance between practice facilities and the stadiums and everything kind of going on because people here, they obviously want it in the city, but apparently more in Virginia is a better, is an easier option for the team. Yeah. I don't, I don't think it really truly matters. I mean, you know, you're all, you're busting out there anyways, regardless. I mean, yeah. so it doesn't really matter. Yeah. It's interesting. It's a matter, yeah. matter of a few minutes. Yeah. No, traffic. Tra I don't know if the traffic over there is not, is it like on game days? Not, not too bad. Right. Uh, well, there's, there's only like two ways in, okay. and there's going to be three ways in pretty soon. Yeah you know, which will alleviate some of the, the traffic, but you know, you get, you got to get there early just like you do at any place, but yeah. not quite as bad as probably DC is now. Yeah. But you, you guys are getting a little bit more of a turnout at the stadium. The, the DC, a lot of fans are watching from home. So hopefully we can get some more, more, more wins on this season. Um, well, yeah. You win, people, if you win, they come. Yeah, that's very <laughs> true. So I want to kind of dive into your career a little bit. So I saw you weren't always a scout. I said you kind of first were in coaching. Yeah, I started, um, <laughs> I was really, really lucky to be in the right place at the right time for that also. Um, <laughs> I was talking to Mike McCarty today, Bill McCarty's son. Um, I signed with Chuck Fairbanks, you know, to go to the University of Colorado. Well, when Matt came in, he said, you know, you're a strong safety. I said, no, sir, I'm a quarterback, right? So I transferred over across the mountains to Colorado Mesa. Now it was Mesa State back then. And sure enough, I ended up playing strong safety. He was right. Um, but I broke my back, uh, broke my fourth and fifth lumbar uh, national championship game. And um, they told me I could quit playing or quit walking. And that was pretty easy for me. I mean, it really was. Um, back then, the NCAA really didn't track, you know, people on the field as much and everything else. So I became a student assistant right off the bat and worked my scholarly off that way, you know, through my entire coaching career, I mean, through my entire uh, college career until I graduated and then I kind of started bouncing around from there um I ended up starting out as a uh, graduate assistant for Grant Taft at Baylor um great great man um you know he's kind of he's kind of the one that started that whole thing down at Baylor that you know he had to need to, he needed to go raise money for a facility it was one of was the big it wasn't the um it was Southwest Conference then yeah so there was there wasn't that big 12 money you know coming in so he had to go raise money, try to build that program. I uh, spent two years there with him. Um, again, luck of the draw, Larry Lacewell, the, the defense coordinator from um, Oklahoma days in Switzer. He was a defense coordinator at Tennessee. Uh, he came down to the visit because we had, uh, we run the same defense as they did. Um, Lacewell just, uh, he had just passed away about uh, a week ago. I don't know if you saw that or not. Um, great man. Very, very, very good football coach. Um, long story short, um, I don't eat lunch very often because it, I get that grogginess after. So I just kind of skip it. I do the breakfast and do dinner. Yeah. And so did he. So we sat around and watched tape, you know, while everybody else was at lunch and he just kept peppering me with questions. And I was sitting in the back of the room and I just answered all the questions he had. And 
when he was getting ready to leave, he goes, what are you going to do? And I go, what do you mean? He's like, well, your two years are up, right? And I go, yeah, but Coach Taft has me at an interview at uh, Mount Pleasant High School, you know, because Texas high school football is, oh, is a big deal. And, and I was going like, you know, I wouldn't mind being a head high school coach at all. Um, and he looks at me and he goes, well, he says, you want to coach defensive ends at the University of Tennessee? And I went, well, yeah, I would love to do that. And I go, do you mind if I talk to my wife about that, you know, first? And he yeah. goes, sure. Before he got to the other door, I said, Coach Lacewell, no, 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 I'll, I'll, I'll take that job. And he said, well, he says, you still got an interview. He says, we'll bring you up next week, right? I walk into the facility with him, and Johnny Majors comes down the hallway, and Larry goes, hey, Coach Majors, I want you to meet your new defensive end coach. This is Drew Fabianic. And he goes, damn glad to have you. That was my interview. <laughs> so, I mean, it was, it was kind of lucky, you know, but – once um, Coach Majors got fired three years later, um, I did too. Um, I was unemployed for about 45 minutes. Um, got a coordinator's job on defense with the uh, University of Tennessee at Martin. Uh, stayed there uh, for, I think, three or four seasons. Um, then I went to Louisiana Monroe, which was um, northeast Louisiana back then. Yeah. Um, and I was the youngest defensive coordinator in Division One history at that point. I was 29 years old. Uh, now, I think Tyrone Nix might have passed that years back, you know, and I think he got it at like 28 at Southern Miss or something like that. But, um, you know, it was a great time. Um, made bad decisions at times, Zach, because at that same point when I went down to Louisiana Monroe, Randy Walker had called me to be the coordinator at Miami of Ohio, right? And I was going, yeah, it's a cradle of coaches. It's a great opportunity, but we had just had a baby and they offered me $10,000 more to go to Louisiana Monroe, which was not a very smart move because Terry Hepner ended up being the defensive coordinator for Coach Walker. Coach Walker ended up going to Northwestern. He passed away about, I think, 10 years ago or something like that. Um, but Terry went on to be the head coach at Miami of Ohio when walk left and then he ended up being the head coach at indiana so sometimes you make really poor decisions for money yeah and being at louisiana monroe you how would i put this in a polite way um you have to play money games uh to support the rest of the you know the athletic department um my last year down there we uh we ended up being five and six lost my job but we also played Florida, Kansas State, and Arizona, all three were in the top five wow. that year. So, you know, I was I was talking to Mike Tomlin a couple of days ago. He was at uh, Arkansas State. Wow. And that was our that was our last game. You know, we're both five and five, right? And we we laugh about it every time we're together. He says, Well, he's a Drew. He says, one of us is getting fired today. And I always go, Yep, that was me, Mike. <laughs> And you're there to Steelers and I was out of a job. So, I mean, that's just the nature of the beast yeah. with, with coaching. Um, I came to Texas to be a defensive coordinator here also at uh, WT White High School, went two rounds deep into the playoffs. Uh, the first time they had done that in like 15 to 20 years. And I was sitting around at a Nike clinic with an old, old coach that was, uh, you know, in the state of Texas, Leo Britton, he's a kind of a legend out of Wichita Falls. I'd recruited his area and all that. And he goes, that's true. He said, what are you doing here? And I said, Coach Britton, I said, I want to be a head ball coach down here, kind of be in control of my own destiny, right? And he goes, you're not ever going to get a Texas high school head job. And I go, why is that? And he goes, well, he said, for one thing, you're not a Texan. He said, second, he says, you're a college ball coach and you think you're all the better than we are. And I said, well, Leo, I said, we are, you know, I was being kind of a smart ass because he was kind of being a smart ass too. And he said, and the other thing, he said, they're going to look at your resume, the search committee, and they're going to say the first good college job that comes open, you are going to take it. And I said, that's not the case. He said, but that's, he said, but that's how they're going to look at it. Right. Fast forward. Um, I say the hell with it. And I go to work for golf digest as a regional sales manager. Really? Like a year. Yeah. Most, most money I ever made in my entire life, okay? Wow. And it was the easiest 
job that I ever had in my entire life, but not challenging at all. And fast forward again, Larry Lacewell is now the director of college scouting with the Dallas Cowboys because he had coached with Jimmy Johnson. Well, he asked me to come on board as a Blesto scout, which is the lowest of the lows. The combine scout is where it all starts in the spring. And, you know, you're the grinders. You're the one setting up the table for everybody else. And, you know, that's on, that's in the Blesto organization with the other teams that are part of it. Yeah. So, so I did that um, for a year and a half, uh, got promoted um, to the Southeast and then to the Midwest and then on to national. And I did the national role 14 years. Wow. And the worst part about it is when people go, oh, what a cool job. And I said, what's the last word you say? It's a yeah. job. Yeah. I mean, and I spent, I looked up my nights in Marriott and I spent 5,444 nights in a Marriott over 18 years. What's the best one? Ooh, the best one for for vacation or for travel? Or just like amenities, like if you, you've probably been to every Marriott on the list. Uh, just, I mean, put it this way, the, the Ritz-Carlton Kapalua, I mean, is Marriott property and it's incredible. Yeah. Uh, Marco Island, um, the JW Marriott, incredible. Yeah. Uh, that Those are more for vacation. I, yeah. I tried to put it this way, as many places I had to go to, Zach, I just wanted it to be, just be clean. I mean, and over the last couple of years, that's become pretty difficult at times because they don't have enough people. I mean, a friend of mine, um, he's a GM up at the uh, Hotel Chicago, and he had let 150 employees go when COVID hit. And then when he reopened, how many do you think came back? Not many because everybody's looking for people. 30. 30. He got 17 floors, right? All those rooms. He said, I'm cleaning rooms. And he's a general manager. So, I mean, it's, as I said, it, I try to find just the nicest, cleanest, newest yeah. place to be just because I've stayed in some really, 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 really bad ones. Yeah. I mean, really bad base hotel kind. You know what I mean? Incredible. Yeah. So, so when you, when you first got with the Cowboys and you're kind of just kind of the lower level scout, what were kind of like day-to-days for you? Well, when you, when you do it, when you do the blessed work, you do it in the spring. Okay. So you don't do it in the fall. You're, you're out when everybody else is back for meetings, like in March and April, yeah. pro days in March and April, you're out doing pro days for next year's, okay. you know, class. So what you're doing is you're evaluating those guys, you know, for those clubs that are, you know, subscribers in blessed or NFS, there's two different organizations that do yeah. that. And so my day to day would be to go into the school. I would, you know, identify every single eligible player, um, actually have to evaluate them too at yeah. some point during the next, two or three days, you know, I try to do it then. Yeah. And you'd also have to height, weight, measure, run them if they'd let you. Um, and I did 65. My first year was, was absolute hell in the Southeast. It was, I did 65 and 75 days and it was all back to back to back. I mean, it could be like West Alabama one day, Alabama, the next, and then like North Alabama, you know, you're just going through the whole region that you had to cover. And you were doing that, you were giving them the Wonderlick test, you were measuring them all, you are evaluating them all, you are writing reports. And then at this time of year, like NFS meetings are going on right now in Florida. Yeah. They're presenting this next class to the teams that are subscribed into that. Yeah. So, so my day-to-day in the spring was a heck of a lot different than my day-to-day in the fall. You know, because blessed the work is the hardest work you, you have to do because you not only have to do the evaluation part, you have to do the measurement part, you have to do the wonderlick part, you have to do the interview part, you have to do just, I mean, you have to talk to the coaches, you got to put background in. I mean, the guys that do that, you learn more from doing that than any other thing that I ever did, just because it's pushed on you so fast and so hard that you either put it this way, you either keep up yeah. or you fall off the train. Yeah. I mean, there, there are a lot of guys that can't do it. And if you don't have good time management skills and you don't understand, you know, where to put things, I mean, you know, in the order that you need to do them, it's a very hard job. It truly is. Yeah. And then now with, with the transfer rules is even harder because some guy, you might go to a school one day, evaluate everybody. And the next day they get a top recruit and you weren't there. Yeah, absolutely. And put it this way, they get sprung on area scouts all the time. I mean, because these guys, they can show up all the way till the first day of practice. doesn't matter. Yeah. I mean, and put it this way, 
why do you think that a lot of places aren't naming their starting quarterback yet? Yeah. Because as soon as they do, there goes number two. Yeah. And that's just the nature of the beast now. Their game, they have to figure out that they truly have free agency with no contracts. Yeah. And once they figure that out, they, they go, they, the universities have to create almost another department, just like we have a pro department and a college department. They yeah. have to almost have like a portal department, an NIL department, and then a high school department. And they need to be all separate because they're all separate entities. Yeah. And they all work differently. Incredible. So, what, what was your first year? What year was it with the Cowboys? Who, first year? Uh, 03. How, how did you guys find Romo? Um, that, that's a, a really long story. Um, he was a camp, no, he was a combine arm. He wasn't, he, he wasn't even in the quarterback group. He was the guy that threw to the tight ends or, you know, threw to the running backs or whatever. And we had an old, uh, we had an older scout named Jim Hess that he coached at, uh, gosh, I think he coached like San Angelo and, um, Stephen F. Austin and, and, um, New Mexico state. Um, and he was down on the field with Tony and Tony's a, a really engaging, you know, guy. He really is great talker, great, great order. I mean, I mean, just fun to be around. And Hess was kind of like that. He was into that. He was that down home, Texas, you know, draw guy that, you know, was always clowning. And, you know, he got to like, he got to like Tony and we had a, a draftable grade on him. Um, and it was Sean Payton and Jim Hess that really pushed that. And they got Parcells on the phone um, in free agency to offer him as much as we could at the time. And he took, I think he took five less than what Denver was offering because Shanahan was an Eastern Illinois grad, just like Sean Payton was, right? So Sean pulled that card, but then Shanahan was pulling that card too, you know? Um, but it was, it was, and it, it goes, it twists a little differently too. And I mean, I can say this and there's nothing disparaging about this or whatever, but when I was evaluating the quarterbacks in camp, right? And this was 22nd year. And, you know, Bill just, Bill just didn't like how he was a gunslinger, you know, I mean, just, you know, was careless with the ball. I mean, you know, just, he, he was a true gunslinger. He's like Brett Favre. Right. And, um, you know, I, I, I told coach, I said, you know, if he ever sees the field, he ain't ever coming off. I mean, cause he's got that. He had what you can't teach. He had the instincts to see things and feel things spatially that a lot of guys can't. I mean, he'd, he'd hit a check down without even looking at it. He knew it was going to be there. You know, he just instinctively felt things. And guys that have a feel back there are hard to find. I mean, too many kids are mechanic. I mean, they're, the mechanics are almost robotic now. Yeah. Because all they do is throw seven on seven all day long. They don't feel the game as a game. They feel it as, you know, as wide open spaces now. So that's how Tony ended up there and put it this way. I think it came to a point where, where Bill just said, Hey, we're going to give him a shot, put him a run at it. And yeah. guess what? He took off. I mean, how do you, how do you think the process missed him so much, which is nobody paying attention to some of the small school guys, or do you think just nobody yeah. gave the time of day? No, I think it, I think it has a lot to do with small school guys, especially when small school guys don't actually play against like a Purdue for a money game or something yeah. like that, you know, cause all of a sudden if a guy, um, like DeMarcus Ware, yeah. right? Uh, he had like, I think four sacks against Marshall. Yeah. Right. Well, guess what? That's higher level competition than yeah. playing in the uh, Ohio Valley conference against, um, you know, Tennessee Martin, you know, or whatever. Um, guys get overlooked. Tony was small. Uh, he wasn't super, super big. Um, he was real productive. Um, you could see on tape that, that he understood the game at a different level. You know, now, again, I didn't personally do him then because I was doing the Blesco stuff right then. Yeah. Um, but I evaluated him after he got to the Cowboys, you know, because we evaluate our own players in August at training camp. Yeah. And with DeMarcus, I saw that he had like a second round grade, but you guys went and grabbed him in the first round. What, 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 what sold you on him? Oh, he had a first round grade in our, in our place. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, that it was... um it was between him and Marcus Spears. We had two first. Yeah, but you end up getting both of them. Yeah, 
<laughs> yeah, and uh, good Coach Parcells, Coach Parcells wanted to take Spears there, and we were like, everybody kind of believed that we could get him down to like 21, or I think it was 21 or 25, and everybody wanted to take DeMarcus at 10. You know, I think it was 10, uh, yeah, I think it was 10, because it was between the rushers that year were Sean Merriman, Merriman and him. Yeah. And we brought, we brought them both in and loved them both. And, you know, you couldn't ask for a better person, a better player, or a better, you know, leader than DeMarcus. He grew immensely in his first, like, two or three years. I mean, as far as just across the board. I couldn't even tell you where Tro- where's Troy University. You've probably been there. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. Uh, and what's funny is that if you, if you knew about the other one that was there right before him, do you remember the other the, defensive end that was right there right before him? No. It was O.C. OC went to Troy. Yes. Yes. That's a yes. good one. And everybody said, you know, well, why I got to go to Troy? Yeah. You know, well, because this guy was like, and I didn't, and I didn't say this in the report when I presented it. Yeah. But I watched him do 20 plyo box jumps on a 30 inch box, 20 of them in 25 seconds. Yeah. And that's incredible. And the guy ran. I mean, I, I go, what are you going to run? He goes, he goes, well, I'm going to run four six. I go, not today. You're not. Because it was it was raining pretty good, right? And he still ended up running like four six eight for me, right? And then he ended up running four five five, I think, at the combine. And explosive, I mean, you know, natural. I mean, Coach Parcells asked him to stand up and rush, you know, down at the senior bowl and they accommodated him, you know, because you know, when coach had asked one of the coaches to do something, normally normally they jump, you know. Who's the kind of like the biggest small school guy you found? You said you guys gotta come check this guy out. I don't know if it was, I don't, I don't know if it's really that you're finding them, you know, because put it this way, there's no secrets anymore. No. There, there, there's really not. Um, I'll tell you what, it was probably, probably Joe Mays up at North Dakota state. Um, I mean, smaller guy, um, you know, I mean, yoked up, I mean, fast, quick, but he was about five, 10 and a half, about two fifteen, two twenty. 220. Um, strike you could run um people just overlooked him because he was smaller you know um i think he played for denver for about eight or nine years um i I mean i loved the way he played that's what kind of got me going and that's kind of the smallest of the small schools that you know that was before north North dakota state was good don't get me wrong but they weren't winning every single national championship you know they were now interesting so that's incredible what about um? I uh, you, I saw you guys grabbed uh, Demarco Murray third third round. What, what sold you on him? Um, everybody everybody had almost exactly the same grade on him. I mean, almost it was strange, and everybody said he was a starter. Everybody said he was you know built to last, um, strong, physical, um, you know, kind of do it all. Was a good blocker. Um, you know, I think we got him as a, in the third as a steal. I mean, yeah. because what he became. But, you know, he wasn't a real dynamic, make you miss kind of guy. He was a one cut zone runner and he fit what we did perfectly. And he was really, really productive for us because we kept feeding him and he kept getting stronger. Um, it's, it's like I said, it's, it's hard to miss on certain people and the people are what actually bring, bring you to it sometime. I mean, the best linebacker I've ever seen was Sean Lee. And I wish he would have been healthy throughout yeah. because if he ever would have made it through a season, there would have been no doubt he would have led the entire league in tackles every single year, Correct. but he just, he just couldn't stay healthy. And it wasn't, it wasn't his fault. I mean, there were major injuries, Yeah. but, but, it, but the person is what sold you. I mean, everybody you talk to up there said intense, loves to play, would play in the parking lot for free, you know? That's that's when you start clicking and you start thinking, hey, you know, this this could be the right one at the right time, you know, and the right time is now to bring in those types of leaders. The more people you can more people you can bring in like that, the more your culture changes. It can't be just one person. One person can't change it. It's got to be a, a group that that works together to change your culture. Were there any guys that you, you saw that you, you fell in love with, but then you either like a weird off field thing or just something that you saw that what it was just like, this, this is kind of off. And you said, you know what, I don't, I don't think we should go with them. Any, anything like that, just kind of just things you like, maybe they didn't gel well with teammates or they had a weird interest that you could see they just weren't all there. 
but other than that, no, like, I, no, I think it, I think it's more about I think it's more about the tape, what you see on tape, because sometimes, well, most of the time, you can see their character on tape. You understand what I'm talking yeah, about? Yeah. Um, I won't go into names, of course. You know, because I'm not going to bash guys, of course. Um, but there was a enormous defensive end, enormous, and he was a first round pick, and. Every time I turned the tape on, I, it just kept bothering me. Kept bothering me. Just one aspect of his game just kept bothering me. But I was going like, "Oh, he's, he's six six. He he runs around. He he's got great speed. He's got good get off and everything else." He wouldn't stick his face in on anybody. Didn't want to. Interesting. And in in our game, you have to. And he just refused. He he, he ended up being a bust, yeah. right? But not two to three years later. I see the same guy, different team. And I go, nope, I saw it the first time. I'm not falling for it. And guess what? It, that's, that's when the Rolodex of just what you see and what your yeah. biases are, you know, kind of bring you to a point where you go, I'm not going to get fooled again. And it's normally you get fooled by measurables and you get fooled by the athletic quote ability and the athletic scores or your PFF grade, yeah. right? It's the tape. Yeah. It comes back to it comes back to the tape, and I made a I made a statement to a, a scout that I that was a long long time scout, and I was just starting out, and I said I said how in the hell does a guy bounce two rounds after the combine, and he goes because they go for the measurables and they don't worry about the tape, and I said well I said what would you do he says he said your first instinct is normally the correct instinct. Yeah. And it always comes back to what that was in the end. Say a guy was a six round guy, all of a sudden he catches a bunch of steam, he gets drafted in the fourth round and he ends up being a lifer as a backup for maybe three years. Guess what? Your sixth round grade was your right grade. Yeah. The fourth round grade that they gave him and took him, they're wrong. Yeah. I mean, that's it, it, what he's saying is it, it always comes back to usually what you saw in the first place. Yeah. But too many people don't understand the whys of the game. And all they do is look for the athletic traits. And I'm just going to grade the athletic traits. The athletic traits are going to take me to a good football player. No, that's yeah. not always the case. Yeah. You got to have, you got to have both. Because the reason I ask you is because Washington took, took Sam Howe from UNC and they obviously had a pretty steep decline, and then they found out that he doesn't eat steak, burgers, or seafood, and I assume they took him to a steakhouse before they drafted him. Apparently, he brings chicken tenders to every steakhouse, and that would have been something in my scouting report, but nobody found that out until after they took him, and I'm like, isn't that something like, this is a little off? But I think I don't think that has anything to do with football, though. I, I know, you know, I know, but like if he's got chicken tenders in his pocket on the field, that, that might be a flag of some sort. No, that's not going to be on the field, but, yeah, but yeah. And I think they stole him. Yeah, I do. you think so? Oh, he had he had the he had the prettiest stroke of the entire class. I mean, he threw the best ball of any of them. And the reason why he caught so much, you know, caught such a steep downfall, because he's small. Yeah. Wait till you see Bryce Young next year. You want to talk about small? Yeah. He's small. Do you think that they, they, they'll be saying next year on the draft he's got to put on muscle? He he can't hold up. He or, yeah. Sort of thing. Yeah. yeah. He's less. He's less than six foot tall. Yeah. You know, blah blah blah. They're gonna be kicking. And again it's valid because there aren't a lot of them. Yeah. You know, but you also have to say, you know, Hey, there's Kyler Murray there too. Yeah. Okay. He's successful. Now he's yeah. successful from the shotgun. He's yeah. successful because they deepen him up so he can see, you know, but would he be a pocket guy like Drew Brees was? No. I mean, somebody mentioned it in, in our war room about Sam Huff. How many, how many guys are six foot or less? I go Drew Brees. Yeah. I mean, they're there. Yeah, it's just you got to get the opportunity. Yeah. So I, again, I'm not blowing up the Redskins. I'm just saying <laughs> I think Dolan, I really do. Interesting. How, how do you guys find Dak? How, how, did you guys see what we see now when when you're looking at him in Mississippi State? No, he was he was a uh, he was a great leader. Yeah. Took him to places where they'd never been before. Um, they were actually ranked number one first time ever. Right. Um, everybody you talked to said he's a pipe piper. Everybody follows. He works out twice a day. You know, he, he does everything. He was inaccurate. His lower body mechanics weren't great, um, but he was a winner. And, you know, for us to luck up, because we did, we lucked up, yeah. you know, get him in the fourth. 
Um, Wade Wilson really liked him. Scott Linehan really, really liked him. Um, they thought they had something to work with. And everybody at the Senior Bowl that worked with, you know, Dak said that he was all that. And people say it. Some guys have it. Yeah. And he does. Not a lot of people do. They, they, they may think they do. Yeah. But they don't. When you can follow with, when you can have people follow without you doing or saying anything, that's special. And he can do that. After, did you have a feeling he was going to be the week one starter after you saw him in the preseason that one year? Uh, I thought he really played well uh, and said, you know, well, I mean, he, he might as well because Tony was still hurt. Yeah. You know, um, you know, it's too bad for Tony because that team was, that team was built for him. Yeah. You know? Um, you know, and God bless him. I, I wish we would have surrounded Tony with a hell of a lot better players, you know, throughout his career, you know, make his life a hell of a lot healthier. Yeah. You know? But no, I think the world of Tony Romo. I yeah. don't get me wrong. Um, but Dak is Dak's got it too. So did yeah. Tony. You know, and that's what's that's what's lucky because I think, and I'm not, I'm gonna I'm gonna quote this, and I think I'm right. From Troy Aikman to Tony Romo, okay, I think there were 17 starting quarterbacks for the Dallas Cowboys. Okay. Wow. And you wouldn't be able to remember half of them. I mean. You know, I mean, uh, Hutchinson, you know, I mean, you know, uh, Stephen Wright, you know, from South Carolina. I mean, uh, even um, Jason Garrett, coach, one of, the, one of the credit QBs. Well, he he was with Troy. So, so he was never really a starter. Okay. He only played. He only started a couple of games you know, when Troy was there because he was already, I think, at the Giants in yeah. their back. Too. Um, gosh, no, there's I mean, seriously, there's uh, gosh, the, the quarterback uh, pitcher from. Um, oh, I know you're talking about. I forget his name. Uh, Drew, Drew Henson. Yeah. Um, you know, we had a uh, Clint Sterner, you know, I mean, th there's a, there was a long line. If you, and if you don't have one, <laughs> you're not winning a lot of games. Oh, you're just not. How, how'd you guys find a Gallup at a, where's it Colorado state? Um, because of the area scout, you know, um, Ross Winchie really, really liked him. Um, and I, and again, I think we got him in the fourth, I think. I think third, third or fourth, yeah. Third or fourth, right? Um, which you know is for what he's become. Um, that's that's a really really good value. Yeah. Um, you know he was physical. He wasn't a great route runner. Um, he was a little weaker then. Um, he's gotten bigger, gotten more physical, and he is a contested ball guy now. Plus, he's that nine ball guy too. He's got that deep long speed. Um, you know to get over top. So he's developed, and you know again, I hope he comes back from the injury because. You know, he deserves it. Yeah. And with, with, with Parsons, why, why do you think he fell so much? Because he was incredible last year. Probably because he didn't play. Yeah. I mean, you're taking a risk on a guy that really didn't play what for almost name? two years. Ch Chase didn't play either. Do was, was, you think it's just, it doesn't really? It just... Yeah. Yeah. I mean, because you could see, you could see every bit of talent, you know, with him. And again, you got to give our coaches credit too. Oh, yeah. I mean, Dan Quinn, George Edwards, Joe Witt. I mean, you know, all the guys on defense, Aiden, they use the player to their skill set. Yeah. They don't force a round peg into a square hole. Yeah. They don't. And that's that's what I think that they've done. I mean, Javon Curse never started a game. Yeah. Ever until they came to us. Yeah. And they found a they found a role for him. And, you know, like I said, if you if you give somebody a role that their skill set fits. And they can attack people, they're hard to stop. Yeah. I mean, you know, can Parsons play up? Can he play, you know, yeah. can he play off the ball? Can he play on the line of scrimmage? Yeah, he can, he can do it all. But you got to be able to use him the right way. Yeah. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah. It's incredible. So, no. It's incredible. And, and, and trust me, and, and trust me, he was the highest rated player, defense player on our board. And they traded back and still got him, right? Did they yes. Trade? yes, because we look, we look, we look down and we said, doesn't look like anybody's taking linebackers. That's incredible. I mean, that's part of that's part of the game too. When you're yeah. looking, you know, at your stack, you're going like, okay, well, who's coming up? Okay, what are their needs? I mean, are they going to try to? Is there anybody going to come up above us? Yeah. You know, thinking that we're going to take them because they thought we were taking a corner. Yeah. Right. And then corners fell off, and we were like, okay, we still got this chance. We bumped yeah. down, get another pick. Hey, we got we got lucky. Yeah. You know, but guess what? We also were smart about it because we yeah. looked at teams below us and said who's really truly going to take Parsons. Yeah. I and thought like, Washington was going to grab him. And they, I think you guys scooped him up and they, they took the kid from Kentucky. Yeah. So yeah, that was, that's incredible. 
And then so with with um like are there any guys in this for this this next crop of uh, talent for next year the guys that you kind of jumped off the page that you're like all right this guy I've seen everything I needed to see this guy this guy's the real deal. Yeah, we ended a kid at Alabama. Why is it pretty so high in him? What's different about him? He's like Demarcus Ware. He's got that kind of explosiveness, that kind of strength, that kind of that kind of flexibility. He's going to be a big time rusher. And yeah. Boy, you can get a big time rusher now. Yeah, go up and get him because. You know, people say, you know, hey, sacks are important. No, sacks are usually, usually drive stoppers. Yeah. So guess what? That guy's more important. Yeah. You know, so that's just my take on it. Yeah. And with this with this year's class with um, were you shocked how Walker just kind of flew up the boards like in the last few weeks and then jumped Hutchinson? <sighs> no, because, you know, he played about four different four different alignments down there, Georgia. Yeah. and he really never got to be good at, you know, any of them, but you could see all the, the raw talent and strength and flexibility. And you saw him in space. I mean, you saw all the traits, but you also saw him making plays from alignments that he shouldn't have been making them from. And when you play four or five different alignments, you know, you don't, your body, your reps, the, you know, the movements don't come as easy as they would if you were just playing one spot, you know, and, I mean, I love I love Hutchinson too. I did, you know, because my bias is guys that play with their hair on fire, you know, because at some point during that game, that guy that lines up against him, he's going to outwork his ass yeah. and he's going to make a play. Ryan Kerrigan, yeah, Ryan Kerrigan was a hair on fire guy. Loved yeah. him, you know. He's still a free agent. I think nobody's picked him up yet. Oh, that's well, but he's but he's older now. I mean, yeah. So that's, that's really interesting. Who, who's the best prospect you've scouted since you went since you? From, from since you started with the Cowboys, who's the highest graded player you ever had? Oof. Probably Clowney. Really? Yeah. Yeah. He was dominant in college. I mean, every aspect of his game, he was dominant, you know? And I think part of his downfall was he got injured early. Yeah. And then kind of, you know, didn't take care of himself. And I heard that he, you know, didn't do what he should have, you know, yeah. off the field. But again, I don't know that for a fact. I'm just yeah. st- you know, you hear, but yeah, he was the highest rated player. And then probably, oof, probably Zeke. Really? Yeah. Zeke was the best. He was the best running back without the ball I've ever seen. Interesting. And, and I mean, great blocker. Yeah. I mean, great in pass protection, you know, great on special teams. Um, you know, he was, he's complete. Yeah. I mean, he was hurt at the end of last year. Yeah. I mean, he was. He looked really, really good at the start of the year, and hopefully he'll come back and be healthy because he's for real. And don't be sleeping. I mean, interesting. Don't be sleeping. What about what about quarterbacks like the highest graded quarterback that didn't pan out? Mine was probably uh, Connor Cook. Really from Michigan State? Yeah, I thought Connor Cook was going to be a starter in the league. I didn't think he was going to be great, yeah. but I thought he I thought he was going to be a starter in the league. Interesting. And for some reason, he just never hung on, but he had, he had all the tools. Um, he did. He had the arm, he had the height, he had the length. I mean, he was accurate. I mean, he did a really good job at Michigan State. I mean, yeah. with a pro system. I just, I thought he was going to be a starter yeah. and he just never panned out. Yeah. Um, the other one would have been the um, kid from Memphis. A Lynch? Yeah. Yeah. Athletic, long physical i mean good accuracy i mean in college um i don't know why he didn't make it either i thought he could start too yeah yeah there's there's too many other there's too many other factors that come in tangibly for a quarterback and you just got you got to have it and you got to have the work ethic to do it i mean kirk cousins is is a good player yeah right but he really 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 works at it yeah you know and he always has that's that's his makeup that's why he's successful, not because he's ultra talented. It's because he works at it. Yeah, yeah, you know? that's interesting. So. And it would, of last year's quarterback class, which 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 are the guys outside of Lawrence, who's obviously going to be the number one? Which of the guys did you like the most? Uh, out of this last this last yeah, class, not this. Uh, so last 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 year, so with Lawrence, Fields, Wilson, uh, Mills, uh, Lance, and all those guys. See, I like Fields. I really did. Um, I thought he was, I thought he was the second one. Um, but I think you have to tailor 
an offense around him a little bit more than just saying you got to fit you got to fit into our offense and this is how it's going to be I think you have to you have to give him some different looks and use his athletics athleticism and his size uh, because he's more than capable of making all the throws um, I just didn't think they did a very good job of you know surrounding him with a lot of talent and plus I don't think they helped him game plan wise a lot either you know you got to get the ball out of these young guys hands quickly because you can't leave them back there because if you confuse them, they're going to get killed. I mean, look at David Carr. I mean, I think he had the most sacks of anybody in the history of the game, right? His first year. I mean, when that happens, you can't tell me you're not going to be gun shot. Yeah. That's yeah. interesting. When, when, when Burrow is coming out, what did you, what do you like at him? Cause prior nobody was even talking about him. Because, you know, when he first, when he first left Ohio state, I mean, he didn't play that much and no. put it this way. The team wasn't that damn good. No. Um, you know, I, I thought he had a chance. Um, but again, that talent took over down there now. And he has, he has Moxie. He's got, he's got it too. And he's another one of those guys that doesn't have to say anything for people to follow. You know, his dad told me about him. I mean, gosh, he was, um, his dad was D coordinator at Ohio U. Yeah. Right. And he goes, uh, and I've known him cause he was, uh, he was in Nebraska too. Right. And that was when we were coaching. And he goes, uh, he goes, yeah. He said, you ever see young Joe? And I was like, I was like, where's young Joe at? He goes, he's Ohio State, right? So I went there, and it was like after that weekend, and I saw that Cardell Jones was still there. And the Barrett uh, Haskins. They had Haskins, and they also had um, they also had that little Tate Martell. Okay. Oh, yeah. yeah I know you're talking about. You no, know I'm talking about yeah, yeah. From Vegas. Right? Yeah. Um, and I was going like. I saw Haskins throw and I go, ooh. I said, wow. You know? Then I saw Burroughs throw and I go, yeah, nice. But he's small. Yeah. He's very, I mean, he was skinnier then than he was yeah. even now. And, you know, they didn't expect him to be that either. But even Tommy Moth at the, the spring coach down there, he told me, he said, he was just like Peyton Manning when he walked in the building. He said, you could just tell. He said he had a different vibe about him. He said, and it, everybody took to it. And everybody said, this guy's a gamer. You know, and he just kept he just kept climbing because he wasn't playing at Ohio State. Yeah. I mean, so guess what? You're you're not playing. You're not getting any better. So, and put it this way, Haskins did a pretty damn good job at Ohio State too, didn't yeah. he? So, but that's again, a lot of this comes back to the intangibles on these guys and their work ethic and how they how they approach the game, and I think that's that's overlooked sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. Do you think in the coming years you're going to start seeing more scouts kind of going outside the United States to look at look at talent? Because I feel like there's just an untapped everywhere. I know that the game hasn't grown that much, but I feel like eventually, like there's going to be someone that. Oh, I'm sure there will be. There's there's some from you know London and everything. We had the the Efi uh, kid that played for uh, Carolina for a few years. Uh, we had him uh, Efi. I wish I remember his last name, uh, but he came from he came from London. Came with the D line coach. Um, you know, he brought him up as an intern because he was one of our interns. Um, I think that the more it grows and the more the the league's trying to to bring in some international people to get trained and, and yeah. learn, um, it's still a long ways off because, like you said, the game just hasn't picked up, yeah. you know, anywhere else. I mean, other than probably England, yeah. probably really, and maybe Germany a little bit. Yeah. But it's not big in Italy. It's not big in Mexico. I mean, it's just not. So I, I would say, no, I think what, I think what's going to happen more so is I think I think guys that have experience in the league and in coaching, I think are probably going to go, some of them are going to go back to college. Yeah. Because it's become professional football. Yeah. Regardless of what everybody thinks, it, it has. Yeah. And our model fits colleges better now than it has in the past. And that's what I said. You got to have three different three different departments to handle colleges now. Yeah. So I think that's where this is going to start going. I think that it's going to spread out a little bit more. And I think those jobs are going to be more evident to people once they figure out that they need people that have pro experience. Because yeah. I know, I know Mac Brown has like Daryl Moody, you know, that used to coach for him. He was with the 49ers. Right. Um, you know, the guys like that start to pop up everywhere now and they're valuable because we can tell the players exactly what to expect and we can also evaluate the players within this within their program yeah you know, 
and be realistic with them. And what parent wouldn't want a pro guy in the building to help yeah. their kid become a, an NFL player? Yeah. And that's, that's what, as I said, I, and, and again, I think that's more of where personnel may be going. I don't think personnel is going to be going more towards Europe or Mexico or anything like that. I think it'll, the international program will still bring some people over and they'll try to do it that way. Yeah. But they're just so far off because they have literally no football background, no nuances of it. Yeah. I mean, God bless our guy from Mexico. I mean, you know, he just doesn't have a lot of background in it. Yeah. You know, but he's big enough. He's yeah. physical enough. He yeah. just hasn't played very much. Yeah. There's one other guy I was going to ask you about, uh, Demarcus Lawrence. How do you guys find him at Boise State? Uh, small. He was like 228. Um, he was about, he's about the same height. Um, really, really strong in his lower. Uh, jumped off the tape as a pass rusher and was really, really raw in his technique, right? Uh, wasn't, wasn't the same motor that he had now, that he has now, but it was pretty close. He was, he was a, a get after your, you know, get after your ass. And again, yeah. got a little hair on fire. He's got his hair on fire all the time now. Yeah. Um, he has grown immensely. I think he's 272, something like that now. I mean, he was like 228 coming out. And put it this way, after him, there were no more rushers. Interesting. So we had a lower second round grade on him, but we needed to take him because we weren't going to get him in the third because there were no more. And once, once they disappear, you can't manufacture them. So you might have to jump up and, you know, take one where you really don't want to sometimes. Yeah. What do you make on the run of the, the run of the receivers in the first round? Do you think it's going to start becoming a trend? I think it's because they're cheaper that way. Yeah. Because now they can keep them for their five years and then, they can walk away if they need to because you can't put together deals like they did for Adams very often because yeah. it, because it's going to hurt your cap and yeah. it's going to it's going to hurt the rest of your team you know because there's always going to be receivers every single year there's a group of like 12 of them every single year and they're all normally productive yeah. you know i mean there's a couple busts here and there but some of them may be bust because they're not used the right way either you know some of them may be successful somewhere else yeah. So were there any guys you scouted in the later that you knew were going to be a later round guy that you're like, if we get this guy, he, he's, we, we got to, we got to take him. And then right when you thought you might've had him, somebody else saw the same thing and grab him right from you. Uh, Dallas, it was a late guy. It was, um, the Dallas Goddard kid from where, 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 South Dakota state, South Dakota state. Yeah. And Philly jumped us, um, because Whitney had just left. Yeah. Right. And we were we were thinking about taking him right there. And they yeah. jumped us just to get just yeah. to get him. I was like, I was like, I would have been our tight end for the next, you know, 10 years. Yeah. You know, but sometimes that happens. I mean, and, you know, and they did their homework, too. Yeah. I mean, so, I mean, kudos to them. Yeah. Yeah. With, do you think it's do you think it's uh, we're seeing less and less tight ends come out because they're more kind of moving them to other positions or what, what is no. like that? You don't think so? There's no tight ends in any any offenses anymore. No. I mean, there are. Yeah. There's, there's rarely a fullback yeah, and rarely is there a tight end, a real tight end that lines up in line. Now you get some guys that are called tight ends, but they're that six, two and a half, 240 pound guy that's detached all the time. And he's blocking nobody. Yeah. He's, he's not a tight end. I mean, the tight ends of the world are the, the fryer booths yeah. that, that can actually get in line and get dirty, you know, and block somebody, you know, there ain't a lot of those guys out there because, Nobody hardly plays them anymore. Yeah. Ohio State usually has about a group of like three or four tight ends. Yeah. Right. Iowa usually has a pretty good group. Oh, yeah. You know, they had Fant yeah. and they had um, Hawkinson and they've had uh, a couple other guys. Yeah. Kelsey. Yeah. But not Kelsey. Um, you know oh, uh, Kittle. Kittle went there. Yeah. Yeah. Kittle. But you know what I'm saying? It, it, that's, but if you look at any of the other offenses, where are they? Atlanta, that was one of the pits because he, he was one of the highest graded in the year. But he wasn't, but he wasn't really a tight end. Interesting. I mean, he's really a, he's really a big, big slot. Yeah. He really is. Because you know, this way, you're not going to, you're not going to play him with a linebacker. No. You're going to match him with a strong safety or a nickel. Yeah. Because, because he's really a receiver. I mean, yeah. Kelsey, I mean, Kelsey's a good, good tight end. Yeah. He's a good blocker. Is he great? I don't know. But he's more so a receiver. Yeah. I mean, really. So it's just, again, I think the offenses have 
phase those guys out, but it's also changed defenses too, because now defenses don't have bigger linebackers anymore. They got smaller, yeah. smaller guys trying to match, you know, yeah. because going four and five wides all day long. Yeah. And it's a, it's a nickel game. It's a nickel yeah. and dime game now, yeah. which, which has changed. Yeah. And before because I let you go, I was going to ask you, what, what's your wildest scouting story from, from your time with the Cowboys? Oof. Probably the wildest, probably the most biggest ordeal. Yeah. Was when I knew I was going out and I thought it was going to be a one. I wanted to check a bag because I had a lot of, I was going to stay out for 10 days. Yeah. So I checked a the bag. They changed my flight. And I said, can you pull the bag? And they go, Oh no, Oh no, it'll, it'll get there. It'll get there. Um, I landed in Chicago, no sign of the bag. I went four days, no bag because they couldn't catch me because I was going to, you know, so many different places that it was like, I mean, I had to go every single day and buy new clothes and, you know, and try to do the same damn job I was doing. And I promise you, I have never, ever checked a bag ever again. Really? Interesting. Never. We'll never do it ever because it was, it was unmercifully bad trying to find clothes and, and doing that every single day. Yeah. Toilet trees and everything. I, I mean, not, I had nothing, you know? So that was the biggest ordeal. Yeah. Right. That's yeah. wow. That's interesting. Yeah. yeah. Well, I really, really appreciate you taking the time to go on there. Are you on, are you on social media at all or not? No, no, not no. Really. sorry. Don't no. do it, Zach. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But I do, do really appreciate, appreciate you taking the time to chat. Yeah, appreciate you too. And hey, thanks for having me. Absolutely appreciate it.